On behalf of the Washington Statistical Society and RTI International, I'd like to welcome everyone to this year's Gertrude Cox Award presentation and lecture. My name is Jeff Gonzalez, and I'm the current president of the Washington Statistical Society, and it's a pleasure to be here in person. Um, before I begin with some introductory remarks, I'd like to extend a tremendous thank you to Mathematica, especially Faye, Nancy, Rick, and I'm sure many others for all their efforts in hosting this event uh, for us both in person and virtually. I'd also like to give a special kudos to Leanna, Mara, Amy and many others from the WSS and all their help coordinating uh, and setting up this event for us. And then finally, uh, the members of this year's award selection committee for the Gertrude Cox Award, uh, WSS past president Aaron Tannenbaum, WSS president uh, elect Jonathan Auerbach, and from RTI, uh, Daryl Creel, Phil Cott, and Marcus Berofsky. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, the WSS was founded in 1926, and it is the oldest and remains the largest chapter of the American Statistical Association. Our organization aims to foster a vibrant community of statistical professionals, promote statistical research, and promote unity and collaboration among all groups concerned with statistical matters. And awards, presentations, lectures, and other statistical events like this are just a few of those types of activities uh, that we aim to host on a continual basis to help us achieve those goals. And it's great that we're able to bring folks together in person in Washington, D.C., since the emphasis of our programs and activities is directed toward the Washington, uh, D.C. membership. Uh, but we're also fortunate to have an opportunity for participation virtually from all statistical professionals, regardless of location and fields of study within statistics and data science with us today. Today, uh, we're here to remember and celebrate Dr. Dr. Gertrude Cox, one of the founders of modern statistics and a former president of the American Statistical Association. The Gertrude M. Cox Award was established in 2003 between the Washington Statistical Society and RTI International. And it's a prestigious award given out annually to an early to mid-career statistician who has made significant contributions to one or more areas of applied statistics in which Dr. Gertrude Cox worked, survey methodology, experimental design, biostatistics, and statistical computing. This year, we had several very strong nominations, all very deserving of the award. But this year's recipient of the Gertrude Cox Award goes to Dr. Tanya Garcia, an Associate Professor of Biostatistics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Tanya Garcia, who I might also add was recently elected as a fellow of the American Statistical Association, exemplifies the spirit of Gertrude Cox by representing the three areas that Gertrude found the most important, contributions to the field, mentoring, and statistical leadership. As her nominator put it, Dr. Garcia is an outstanding biostatistician as her achievements exemplify the intent and the spirit of the Gertrude Cox M Award. So what are some of those achievements? Contributions to the field. Dr. Garcia's work has appeared in top statistical journals, such as the Journal of the American Statistical Association, the Annals of Applied Statistics and, Bi and Bioinformatics. Dr. Garcia is one of the leading authorities in the country on statistical methods for Huntington disease and currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Huntington Disease Society of America. With respect to mentoring, Dr. Garcia receives frequent invitations to speak on pedagogy and mentorship at national and international venues and has been recognized for her achievements through other prestigious awards. One undergraduate student wrote of her course, Dr. Garcia is beyond outstanding. This encounter with her may have completely redefined my career path because she has triggered in me an immense interest in biostatistics. Dr. Garcia has also been actively involved in national, multicultural, and multidisciplinary organizations promoting diversity in the sciences, including as a mentor in the American Statistical Association's Diversity Mentoring Program. 
And finally, with respect to statistical leadership, Dr. Garcia previously served as chair of the review panel for the strategic initiatives grant funded by the biometric section in 2018 to 2023. This mechanism funds activities that encourage high school and undergraduate students, especially from underrepresented groups, to pursue a career in biostatistics. Since 2016, this funding has helped support five major projects that have exposed students to biostatistics for the first time. She was also co-organizer of StatFest, a one-day ASA conference that inspires high school and undergraduate students from historically underrepresented groups to explore careers and graduate studies in the statistical science. Dr. Tanya Garcia is a person who clearly embodies all that Gertrude Cox strove for. We are honored to have her as our 2024 award winner. Before I turn it over uh, to Dr. Garcia, just a couple of housekeeping and administrative issues. Uh, so this presentation and lecture will be uh, recorded uh, and then posted at a later date to the Washington Statistical Society YouTube channel. Uh, if you're in the room, um, please take a moment to, to mute your cell phones, silent your cell phones. Voices will be picked up on the, on the, um, the microphones. Um, and if you're virtual, please say, um, throughout the presentation, please feel free to post your questions in the chat and we'll take those at the end. And with that, uh, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Tanya Garcia and she'll be giving a talk entitled, The Missing Link, Establishing the Parallels Between Censored Covariate and Missing Data. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, so this talk will be roughly 45 minutes, so there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. So if you can just hold off your questions till the end, that would be great. So this project that I'm presenting today has been done jointly with my amazing team, my current PhD student, Jesus Vasquez, my former PhD student, Marissa Ashner, she's now faculty at Duke, my wonderful collaborator at Penn State, Yan Yuan Ma, and my other wonderful collaborator at Columbia University, Karen Martyr. This project was possible thanks to generous funding from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. For over a decade, I've dedicated myself to modeling the progression of a rare neurodegenerative disease called Huntington disease. For those of you unfamiliar with this disease, you can think of it as a combination of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS. Like Parkinson's disease, Huntington's affects an individual's motor ability. A common motor impairment is chorea, or uncontrollable motor movement. Like Alzheimer's disease, Huntington also affects an individual's cognition, leading to memory loss. And finally, like ALS, Huntington's disease also affects an individual's psychiatric condition, leading to anxiety and depression. In short, Huntington disease is a devastating disease, but there's hope. Unlike most neurodegenerative diseases, we know the exact cause of this disease. Back in 1993, scientists discovered that this disease is caused by a mutation in the Huntington gene. That mutation is a triplet repeat expansion of cytosine adenine guanine, or CAG for short. Anyone with more than 36 CAG repeats has this gene mutation. That means with a simple blood test, we can identify individuals who have this gene mutation from those who don't. Those who have this gene mutation will develop this disease, and those who don't have this gene mutation will not. Now, while the results of that genetic testing can be truly heart-wrenching, from a scientific perspective, being able to identify with 100% certainty who will and will not develop this disease brings scientific hope. That hope is in the ability to study individuals with this gene mutation years before symptoms even show up. By studying these individuals, we can learn the progression of this disease to find when and how to best intervene. One of the studies that started looking at that 
was, a was an observational study of roughly 1,300 individuals who have this gene mutation and were followed for about 10 years. This is a plot of the symptom severity score measured over time. The y-axis is the symptom severity score, where higher scores correspond to worse symptom severity. The x-axis is the number of years an individual is in the study. The each gray spaghetti line corresponds to the symptom severity measured for each individual measured for each individual at their study visits. The dark solid line is the symptom severity measured over time averaged across all individuals. We call that line the average symptom trajectory. Looking at this plot, it looks like the average symptom trajectory initially increases and then decreases, suggesting that symptoms initially worsen, but then get better. That makes no sense since many researchers have shown that Huntington disease is progressive, meaning it gets worse over time. The reason we see this result is because of how I plotted the data. Individuals in these observational studies enter the studies at different disease stages. Some are more advanced, others are less advanced. By using this time scale years in the study, I'm completely ignoring that information. Huntington disease researchers, including me, are well aware of the challenges with the time scale in plotting this data. One way to adjust for those differences in disease staging is instead of using years in study, to use instead years to diagnosis, which is what I've done in this plot. So here, zero represents the year of diagnosis. Negative six is six years before a diagnosis. Positive four is four years after a diagnosis. With this new time scale, we now get a more realistic conclusion of symptom severity over time. Years before a diagnosis, the symptom severity is minimal or non-existent. As an individual gets close to a diagnosis, the symptom severity starts to worsen, and that worsening continues after a diagnosis. Now, even though we get a more realistic conclusion of symptom severity over time, I want you to compare this new plot to the previous one. Notice that in this new plot, there's a lot fewer gray spaghetti lines. Why is that? Well, as a biostatistician, I did something very bad. I deleted data. The reason I deleted data is because to make this plot, I had to know when an individual was diagnosed. I had to know their time to diagnosis. Because without that information, I don't know if I should put their symptom trajectory over here or over here or over here. And one of the challenges with Huntington disease is that we don't always know their time to diagnosis because Huntington disease progresses over decades and very slowly. So what happens is that in these studies, before a study ends, some individuals are officially diagnosed. In that case, their time to diagnosis is known. But often the study ends and an individual is not diagnosed. In that case, we know that the individual will eventually be diagnosed because they have the gene mutation. We just don't know when. In this case, we say their time to diagnosis is not known. And we call this time to diagnosis is right sensor. The reason for that is because even though we don't know when the individual will be diagnosed, we do know it will happen after the study ends or to the right of the study ending. So this clinical problem motivated the statistical problem that we were interested in. How can we model the symptom severity score as a function of time to diagnosis when that time is not known, when that time is right-censored. This problem is known as the right-censored covariate problem because it's this variable, this x, this covariate, that is right-censored. So to start tackling that problem, let's look at a very basic regression model. So here, 
I'm modeling the relationship between an outcome Y and covariance X and Z. So in our problem, when the individual is diagnosed before the study ends, their time to diagnosis X is known. Otherwise, if the individual is not diagnosed before the study ends, their time to diagnosis X is not known. It's right centered. Our goal is to find a consistent estimator for the regression parameters beta and the model variance sigma squared, which for simplicity, I'm going to put together into a common parameter theta. In other words, our goal is how can we estimate theta when we don't always know X? Now, that problem of not always knowing X may make you think of a more widely studied problem, missing data. Because in that situation, we don't always have the full information about the data. So X being right censored sounds very similar to X being missing because in both cases, sometimes we know X and sometimes we don't. So that led my team and I to dig into the missing data literature. We wanted to find methods that led to consistent estimators when X was missing. You may think like we did, well, since X missing and X right censored are very analogous to each other, perhaps we can borrow methods from one and apply them to the other. Well, when we did that, we got some unexpected results. When we applied the methods when X was missing, the methods behaved exactly as they were designed. But when we applied those same methods to the case when X is right censored, we got the complete opposite. That unexpected results led us back to the drawing board. We reread the papers on these methods. We double checked our implementation, but there was no, no luck, no progress. After months of no progress, I asked my team to adopt a concept known as beginner's mindset. Basically, I asked my team, to put aside all that we thought we knew about missingness and censoring, and to approach this right censored covariate problem as if we were beginners. I asked them to ask question after question, the more basic, the better, so that we could get full clarity on this problem. When we did that, that's when we started to make progress. So first, we started by writing out the two problems side by side. So let's take a look at the right sensor covariate problem. So in that case, we have data W and delta. W is the minimum between the time to diagnosis X and a random censoring time C, which in our case is the time to study exit. Delta is an indicator that's one if X is known and zero if it's not known. So to put that into context, when the individual is diagnosed before the study ends, then X is smaller than C, so W equals X and delta equals one. When the individual is not diagnosed before the study ends, then C is less than X, so W equals C and delta equals zero. We're going to make some assumptions that are pretty common in the censored covariate literature. So we're going to assume that Y and C are independent of each other, and that the time to diagnosis X and the censoring time C are independent of each other. That last assumption is something known as non-informative covariate censoring, and basically happens, for example, when an individual is not yet diagnosed, but the study ends for an administrative purpose, like the study reaching its end date. In that case, censoring has nothing to do with an individual's health and so does not inform that time to diagnosis. Let's look at the missing data problem. So here we have a missingness indicator R that's one if X is known and zero if X is missing. That R is analogous to the delta that we set up before. We're going to make assumptions that parallel the right censored covariate problem so that we can that can help to identify really what are the differences between these two problems. So we're going to assume that Y and R are independent. That's analogous to assuming Y and C are independent. 
And we're also going to assume X and R are independent, which is analogous to assuming X and C are independent. That last assumption is something known as missing at random, and basically means that the missingness R in no way depends on the unknown X. Looking at these last two assumptions, notice that both of them are assuming independence. X is independent of C, X is independent of R. So because of that independence assumption, it can help to think about these as independent censoring and independent missingness. Okay, so in both of these problems, we don't always know X, but these two problems are fundamentally different. If an individual had been in a study for five years and had not yet been diagnosed, we, we know their time to diagnosis X is at least five years. We have this extra partial information about the unknown X. Whereas if in the missing data problem, when X is missing, we don't have any extra information about the true X. We don't know if that true X is here or here or here. So this partial information about X is what really drives the difference between these two problems. And although this partial information seems small, it makes a big impact on how we handle that unknown X. One way we see that impact is in computing the probability that X is known. So let's compute that probability conditioned on data X and Z. So in the right censored covariate problem, the probability that X is known is the probability that delta equals one. Delta equals one is the same thing as saying that X is smaller than C. And by definition, this probability is the integral of the conditional density of C given X and Z, where you integrate over all C such that C is larger than X. Now, because we're assuming independent censoring or C is independent of X given Z, we can go, we can drop that X going from here to here. Now, what about in the missing data problem? Here, the probability that X is known is the probability that R equals one. But because we're assuming what I'm calling independent missingness, or basically that R and X are independent given Z, we can also drop the X going from here to here. So in both scenarios, we can drop the X. But the information about X does not go away in the right censored covariate problem. That information about X stays in this integral that C is larger than X. So the probability that X is known stays a function of X and Z. Whereas in the missing data problem, when we dropped X, we lost all information about X. So the probability that X is known started as a function of X and Z, but is now just a function of Z. Using that same logic, we can do get a similar result when we calculate the probability that X is known conditioned on data Y and Z. In the right censored covariate problem, that probability is a function of Y and Z, whereas in the missing data problem, it's just a function of Z. So looking at these probabilities side by side, again, in the independent missingness or missing at random, this probability that X is known is just a function of Z, whereas here, it's not just a function of Z. This is where my team and I and other biostatisticians in the field had a blind spot. When we saw these results the, about the methods and the missing data literature being just a function of Z, we thought that that same result held true in the right censored covariate problem. And so that's why when we just blindly applied these methods from the missing data literature to the right censored covariate problem, we got those unexpected results. It also, in my view, explains why some of the papers published in the censored covariate literature have substantially more bias than they should because they're using the incorrect results about the missing data problem. So I want to point out now how these probabilities come into play when we adapt methods from the missing data literature. So the first method is the complete case method, 
which discards all observations where some data is unknown and then estimates the parameters with the remaining data. So in this data table, if green means that the data is known and red means the data is unknown, the complete case method will discard all rows where there's at least one red cell. So we would discard data from rows two and three and apply the method to the data from rows one and four. So with the complete case method in the right sensor covariate problem, we would be solving these estimating equations. This function S theta F, that is the score function from our regression model. So because we're assuming that the model error epsilon follows a normal density, this S theta F is then just the partial derivative of the log of a normal density. For the missing data problem, we would solve these equations. Now, comparing those two sets of equations, they're exactly the same except for one cosmetic difference. In the top, we're using delta to denote if X is known, whereas in the bottom, we're using R to denote if X is known. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. So what that means is that with the complete case method, whether X is right censored or missing, we can apply the method um, blindly and it will be correct. What about the other methods? So the next method is inverse probability weighting or IPW method, which assigns weights to the data to reflect what the full data sample would be if no data were unknown and then estimates the parameters. So in our data example, what IPW method would do is assign weights to the data from rows one and four to reflect what the data sample would be if the data from rows two and three were known. So here, we would be solving these estimating equations, which are almost the same except for the weights. Those weights are the probability that X is known, which I argued earlier in the right censored covariate problem, those weights or that probability is a function of X and Z, whereas in the missing data problem, it's just a function of Z. These two equations are not the same. The next method is the maximum likelihood method, which maximizes the likelihood of the data. So in this one, we would be solving these equations which has two parts. The first part is based on the likelihood of the data when X is known. And the second part is based on the likelihood of the data when X is unknown. Now, when X is unknown, you have to integrate over the possible values of X. So in the right censored covariate problem, we would be integrating over all X such that X is larger than C. We have to account for that extra information we know about X. But in the missing data problem, we don't have any extra information. So we have no restriction on this integral. Again, these two equations are not the same. The next method is the augmented complete case method. Now, one of the challenges with the complete case method is that when you, you discard a large amount of data, when there's high rates of censoring or missiness, that means that the estimator that you get can be highly variable. So the augmented complete case method modifies that complete case method to reduce the variability. So here, we would be solving these equations, which has two parts. The first part is the same equations we saw for the complete case method. And the second part is an augmentation term designed to reduce the variability. These equations are almost the same, except for these weights or these probability that X is known. Again, in the right sensor covariate problem, those weights, that pi, is a function of Y and Z, whereas in the missing data problem, that pi is just a function of Z. There's a second term, psi, which is also going to be different because that psi is a function of the probabilities or those pi's. And because those probabilities are different, then the size will be different too. And finally, the last method is the augmented IPW method, which 
The IPW method also discards data, so it's also going to have high variability. So the augmented version modifies that method to reduce variability. Again, we're going to solve these equations, which has two parts. The first part is the same equations that we saw for IPW. The second part is an augmentation term designed to reduce the variability. They're almost the same, again, except for the differences in the weights or the probability that X is known. In the right sensor covariate problem, that probability that pi is a function of X and Z. The missing data problem, it's just a function of Z. So putting all of this together, can we interchange methods? No, except for the complete case method. If you take a method from the missing data literature and apply it to the right sensor covariate problem without adjusting for that partial information, you will get a biased estimator. And that's exactly what happened to us. So having established for ourselves that these problems are indeed different, we wanted to take this one step further. We wanted to ask, will these methods produce a consistent estimator even when some of the distributions involved are wrong? Methods that do that are said to be robust to mismodel. We were interested in that because we wanted to know, could we develop a method that would allow us to estimate the symptom trajectory even when some of the distributions are wrong. So can the distribution be misspecified? On the top row, I'm showing the distributions that are involved in this problem. The first method, the complete case method, which discards data, makes no use of any of these distributions. So it's completely robust to mismodeling all of those distributions. The IPW method has that same level of robustness. The maximum likelihood method does not have that same robustness. It requires correct modeling of what I'm calling Fx given Z, or the distribution for the sensor covariate in the censoring problem, and the distribution for the missing variable X in the missingness problem. For the robustness of augmented complete case, well, it actually depends on which problem you're dealing with. In the right censored covariate problem, we require that the distribution of delta given YZ needs to be correct to get a consistent estimator. Whereas in the missing data problem, we just need one of these two distributions to be correct to get a consistent estimator. This property here about having just needing one of two of the distributions to be correct, that's called a doubly robust estimator. So what we found is that in the missing data problem, the augmented complete case is doubly robust, whereas in the censoring problem, it's not. Likewise, the augmented IPW method, that its robustness also depends on which problem you're dealing with. In the censoring problem, we need the censoring distribution to be correct to get a consistent estimator, whereas in the missingness problem, we need one of two distributions to be correct. That means that the augmented IPW method is doubly robust in the missing data problem, but not doubly robust in the right censored covariate problem. So that's all about robustness. What about statistical efficiency? And by that, I mean the variability of the resulting estimator. So when the distributions are correct, we proved that the maximum likelihood method will be the most statistically efficient. It will produce the estimator with the smallest variability. So the maximum likelihood method is the most statistically efficient, followed by augmented complete case, followed by complete case, followed by augmented IPW, and last, the IPW is the least statistically efficient. So I know I threw a lot of information at you. Let's, let's put this all together. So in the problem where X is subject to missingness, we showed that the IPW method is the most robust, but the least statistically efficient. On the opposite end, the maximum likelihood method is the most statistically efficient, but the least robust. 
The complete case method is as robust as IPW, but more statistically efficient. By design, the augmented complete case method will be more efficient than complete case, but it does lose robustness because we require some distributions to be correctly specified in the augmented complete case that we did not require for the complete case method. The augmented IPW will be just as robust as the augmented complete case, and its statistical efficiency is somewhere between complete case and augmented complete case. Now, when X is right censored, the properties of these methods is almost the same, except that now the two augmented methods lose their robustness. In the missing data problem, these two augmented methods were doubly robust, whereas in the right censored covariate problem, these two are only singly robust. Okay, so we found all of these properties. We we're really happy with that. But we wanted to take this problem even one more step further. We wanted to ask what happens when now we're dealing with informative covariate censoring, which basically means that X and C are dependent on each other. That can happen, for example, when individuals with rapidly worsening symptoms drop out of a study before they're officially diagnosed. In that case, the censoring has something to do with the individual's health and so informs their time to diagnosis. The analog to this informative covariate censoring is missing not at random, or X and R are dependent on each other. Basically, there's a pattern to the missingness. For example, the individuals who are most sick have the most missing data as well. So looking at these two assumptions, again, Notice that they're both assuming dependence, so it can help us to think of these as dependent censoring and dependent missingness. So we went through the, the work to see what happens to our methods, and we found that now, whether X is right censored or missing, and we assume those dependent assumptions, now the robustness and statistical efficiency of these methods stays the same in both problems. It doesn't change like we saw in the independent case. So what does that mean for an analyst who wants to use these methods? Let's look at the dependent setting. So here first, IPW, augmented IPW and maximum likelihood method will involve modeling the distribution or the relationship between C and X in the right censored covariate problem or RNX in the missing data problem. Now we proved that with IPW, you can, you can mismodel those two distributions and still get a consistent estimator. So IPW is nice and robust, but it is the least statistically efficient. So analysts may prefer to use the augmented IPW or maximum likelihood. But the challenge with those two methods is that now you have to correctly model the relationship between C and X or R and X. And that's a really hard problem. For example, in a right censored covariate setting, we never simultaneously observe the C and the X. So getting this distribution right is pretty darn hard. So from a practical standpoint, using these methods really doesn't make much sense. What about the complete case and augmented complete case? So complete case is completely free of all those distributions, so we can freely use it. But again, it is not as statistically efficient as augmented complete case. Now, one of the downsides with augmented complete case is that you do need to correctly model the distribution between delta Y and Z. But that downside is actually an upside because we always observe the data delta, y, and z. So you have a good chance of being able to correctly model that distribution. So out of all of the methods that I talked about, we prefer the augmented complete case because it is practical. So my team and I, we ran many, many simulations to confirm these theoretical properties that we found about these methods. And what I want to turn to now is how did these methods perform 
in an application to actual Huntington disease data set called Enroll HD. So Enroll HD is an ongoing non-interventional observational study of Huntington disease. I started this talk by saying that one of the interests in the field is to model the progression patterns of impairments as a function of time to diagnosis. And of key interest is modeling those impairments in the years leading up to a diagnosis. One of the reasons for that is because if researchers can understand those patterns, they can better test how a, a treatment can modify those impairments before irreparable damage. One of the impairments of key interest is cognitive impairment because cognitive impairment really affects an individual's quality of life. So Enroll HD collected data about the extent and timing of cognitive function. There's something called the Simple Digit Modalities Test or SDMT. This is a cognitive test that measures the coordination of visual scanning, working memory, fine motor speed, and concentration. We modeled these SDMT score as a function of time to diagnosis while accounting for something called the CAGH product score. That CAGH product score is computed by multiplying the number of CAG repeats, so the measure of the mutation, by the individual's age at study entry. That CAGH product score is also known as a disease burden score because it basically measures the pathology of the lifetime of the disease. So we analyzed data from a subset of this study. We were looking at individuals who were genetically confirmed to have the gene mutation. They were not diagnosed with Huntington disease at baseline because we wanted to study the patterns leading up to a diagnosis. And these individuals did not have missing SDMT or CAGH product scores. In the end, we ended up analyzing data from 3,718 individuals and the censoring rate of the time to diagnosis was about 85%. Okay, so when we first applied IPW and augmented IPW, we got some really weird results because by design, augmented IPW is supposed to be more statistically efficient than IPW, meaning the standard errors are supposed to be smaller. But looking at all of these results, the standard errors for augmented IPW are always bigger than IPW. Now, unlike when we first started this project, we now weren't surprised by these results because we had proven that augmented IPW is valid when you correctly model that censoring distribution. And based on these results, we're not convinced that our choice was the right one. We're also even more convinced that that's not the right one based on the next result. So SDMT score is a measure of cognitive function. Higher score means higher cognitive function. So papers published in neurology and brain and behavior have shown that cognitive function declines as an individual gets closer to a diagnosis. So we expect a negative slope relationship. But the augmented IPW is showing a positive slope relationship. It's showing the complete opposite, suggesting that cognitive function increases as an individual gets closer to a diagnosis. That makes no sense whatsoever. We also got misleading results when we applied the maximum likelihood method. So maximum likelihood is also sensitive to mismodeling. But this time, with respect to the distribution for the censored covariate X. So with maximum likelihood, um, first, the literature has shown that higher CAGH product or higher disease burden means lower cognitive function. So we expect this negative slope relationship. But the maximum likelihood method is showing the complete opposite, a positive slope relationship. Again, we believe it's because of how we incorrectly made, made the wrong choice. So we don't really trust results from maximum likelihood and augmented IPW. What about complete case and augmented complete case? So first, by design, augmented complete case is supposed to be more efficient than complete case. 
meaning its standard errors are supposed to be smaller. And we actually see that the standard errors for augmented complete case are smaller than complete case. Now, one of the challenges with augmented complete case is that we do need to correctly model the distribution between delta Y and Z. But because we always observe that data, we have a better chance of getting a, a right answer at that. And we believe our choice is correct because of the following results. One, again, the literature shows, shows that cognitive function declines as an individual gets closer to a diagnosis. We're supposed to see this negative slope and augmented complete case shows a negative slope. Similarly, we're, the literature shows that individuals with higher disease burden have lower cognitive function, so we should have a negative slope, and augmented complete case gives us that negative slope. Now, if you were to compare the estimates from complete case and augmented complete case, they're exactly the same. The only difference between these two methods is that the standard errors for augmented complete case are smaller than complete case. Now, typically, those smaller standard errors can make a, can allow us to better conclude whether a covariate is statistically significant to a model. But in this example, both methods show that all three are statistically significant, so there's really no difference. But still, between the two methods, we prefer augmented complete case because of the smaller standard errors. Our next step in this project is to apply that augmented complete case to learn other patterns of impairment in the years leading up to diagnosis so that we can help clinicians find what those patterns are so that they could possibly test those in a future um, study. So to start wrapping things up, while in retrospect, it may seem obvious now, there is a difference between the right censored covariate problem and the missing data problem. When I first started talking about this problem, a lot of researchers said to me, why are you bothering with this problem when it's already been solved in the missing data literature? We had to question that status quo because not a single method that we borrowed worked as expected in the right censored covariate problem. <clears throat> By asking question after question, we got to the root of this discrepancy and made some discoveries along the way. We were able to identify uh, these five methods and show their robustness and efficiency properties and how those methods relate to each other. By looking at these patterns, we were also to, able to find these five methods work for the case where you have dependent censoring or informative covariate censoring. That's a real problem in practice, but it's a problem that's been barely touched in the censored covariate literature. By seeing these patterns, we also were able to identify a gap in the field. Can we find a method that is as robust as IPW and complete case and as efficient as maximum likelihood method? That's something that my team and I are working on right now. Now, finally, this idea of questioning the status quo is something that I fully embrace when mentoring my mentees. To help them question the status quo and gain clarity in their thinking, I developed a series of training that I call Create Spicy Science. And it teaches biostatisticians how to question the status quo, how to find gaps in the field. The basic premise for Create Spicy Science rests on three key principles, desire, trust, and simplicity. I teach biostatisticians how to find what the field wants to solve, generating the desire, and what evidence the field needs to be convinced of a solution, creating the trust. And I teach these biostatisticians how to communicate that desire and trust in the simplest way possible. I've, my mentees have used this type of training not only to help them develop their own original research ideas, but also to apply for competitive funding and fellowships and awards. I'm proud to say that out of the 35 mentees I've had the privilege of working with, they have so far collected 71 achievements and counting. So in conclusion, I want to encourage my mentees 
encourage all of you to continue questioning the status quo so that we can all be trailblazers in the field. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. I have about five questions. Please. <laughs> uh, I'll just start with one. Sure. Um, let other people join in. Um, so uh, I used to work with Morris Hansen, and he made the point to me years ago that uh, that if two estimators always yield the same result, then they have to have the same variance. Hmm. Uh, and, if, and if your estimators disagree, then one of them's wrong. That's interesting. Um, Just a definition of frequentist. Hmm. It, it comes up in other um, comes up in truncated distributions where people are trying to deal with outliers. The same sorts of issues come up hmm. where people try to pick a censoring point for not censoring, but a truncation point such that their point estimate doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And doing that allows them to claim huge reduction in variance hmm. because outliers are gone. So their estimate of standard error changes, but their point estimates never change. So he's, he was of the opinion that that approach was, was invalid. So, yeah, I, you know, I never heard that before. Um, yeah, we did. I mean, I'm convinced these two met these two estimators. For example, augmented complete case and complete case are indeed very different, and we proved that their the variance is smaller, strictly smaller in the augmented complete case compared to complete case. So I'm, I'm yeah. Is it just coincidence your estimates were the same? I mean, if they come out the same hundred percent of the time. Uh no no no. Uh okay. So in that example, they came up the same, but in our simulation studies, they wouldn't. They were never exactly oh. the same. Yeah. So we, I guess we kind of lucked out in that one example. Yeah. Happy to go on with other questions, but don't want to interrupt anyone else. Um, what about death? Is death another censoring thing? We didn't talk about death at all. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, we haven't. So I've looked at time to death in other applications, but in this one, we didn't. We just focused on time to diagnosis. So you left out people who died. Death, one of the censoring causes. Is that how you lead a study? Is by dying? Oh, oh no, 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 no. None of the people died. None of the people left the study because they died. Oh, uh, yeah. How is that the case? Um, so young people or something? Or? Well, no. These well, okay. So this was um, a ten-year study, and so during that time, the individuals, the average age at study entry was about forty years old. So during that time, like death typically occurs later, like in late 50s, 60s. So we we didn't get into that setting where death was could have been a possibility for them leaving the study. Yeah, I mean, it occurred to me as soon as you put the two things up that sure. one of the common missing uh, missing data procedures, one I use quite a bit, is imputation. Yes, yes. And of course, you know, I thought about it well. Any imputation method for X is going to put mm -hmm. lots, it's going to produce lots of impossible values. So I saw right away, no, that's a problem. You can't use standard missing data rates. Right. Uh, right. I think I just messed. Oh, sorry. There we go. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I, I'm sorry. Yes. So imputation is another um, option. I just want to try to get back to this slide. So I didn't put it, we didn't study it in this particular project, but we did prove in another project that um, imputation will lead to a consistent estimator if the distribution fx given z is correct. So that one is also sensitive to mismodeling as well. There's a question, Sanya. Okay, thank you. So I suppose along that line, uh, you mentioned that people might exit the study if they're uh, if they're poor health, right? Mm -hmm. so could that be treated as a competing risk and kind of yeah then to broaden uh, as another thing to model? Yes, exactly. So going to the 
previous um, person's question. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a really good point about dealing with competing risks. And that's something we haven't yet tackled, but it is something of interest, definitely. Other questions? I guess I have one more. Please. What sort of distributions did you try out for these uh, censoring things? You say you, yeah. you have no data, so how in the world did you come up with candidate distributions? Right, that's a, that's a really good point. So we tried um, several, right? The one that we- Don't all your results depend upon those choices? Uh, yeah, well, yes and no. So, uh, oh no, I don't have that. Yeah, so here, um, in, for some of the methods, for example, where there's a red X or there's a note, we do need to be very careful about how we choose those distributions. Um, but in, to answer your question about how did we how did we model this, we in our in our application we considered um, uh, a joint like a normal distribution for FX given Z and FC given Z. So is it the right one? No, um, but our point was to more to get at um, you know how. Well, in the simulations, we explored what happens to mismodeling, and we showed that there's some, there's some bias that can come up, but it's really to show like how difficult some of these methods can be can be to use in practice. I mean, it just seems to me that the longer the person's been in the study, mm -hmm. that gives you information about when X is likely to happen. Probably right. X is going to be closer to C than if they... Right. Study shortly. Did you use that information? That's a good. You know, no, I didn't. But that's a really good. That's a really good point. To that we, yeah, we definitely want to consider that. So yes, we haven't. Yeah, that information is helpful. Given that you know you just eat, you know the general progression, mm -hmm. uh, I would think you'd want to use the length of time in the study. Right. Right. Um, I see another question. Yes. So have people tried to? treat this as a um, measurement error for X problem? That's a, that's a really good point. Um, that was something that we've also considered because again, it seems like an that analogy, right? Sometimes you know X, sometimes you don't. Um, I've seen some papers, oh, hold on. So, in my reading of the literature, most people are motivated by methods for missing data like we have. I've seen one paper that that hand tries to handle measurement error in addition, but it's not motivated by measurement error techniques. So no, not not yet. Not yet. But that's I like that idea. Yeah. Yes. You said the study is 10 years, so the study is over. Uh yes. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry. Who came in before they were diagnosed who showed no, no symptoms at all mm -hmm. and still might not, you're not getting any more information because the student, the study is over. Right. Seems like a loss of not blood information. Right, right, right. So actually, no, I'm, um, I'm, I created confusion. So the first plot that I showed was from a study that is now over. So the, and application, the one enroll HD, that is still an ongoing study. 718 people, you're still following. But uh, in those 3,000, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, are there any questions from the online folks? Thanks, Dr. Garcia. Yes, we do have some uh, questions from our virtual participants. Uh, first question, in this research, we are mainly interested in time to diagnosis of HD. Mm -hmm. Why is this a good central point for modeling HD progression? In other words, how do we ensure that individuals HD state at diagnosis time is relatively uniform? Uh, I don't if I don't know if the person can answer. What do they mean by relatively uniform? Well, how meaningful is diagnosis? How uniform is it? How how why, why, why do you care about diagnosis? How do you define diagnosis? Okay, so different different questions. So first of all, um, you should you know you should really echo what's being said in the because they won't hear it. I, I think they will, but I'm I'm happy to 
I'm happy to repeat it just in case. So um, one per, so the the questions were how uh, uniform or how reliable is diagnosis? Why use diagnosis? Uh, okay, we can hear questions from the room easily. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, okay, the reason that we're using diagnosis as the central point is because right now, so the clinical trials for Huntington disease are not working. And one of the hypotheses is that it's because we're testing people after they're diagnosed, after it's too late. The One of the interests in the field is to do what's called preventative clinical trials. So to target the disease before um, the impairments get beyond irreparable damage. And so using diagnosis as the central point is a, is a way to for us to tackle the disease in the early stages of the disease. Um, so to answer your other question about how diagnosis is defined, now that is going to open a whole can of worms. So there's a lot of controversy with that. So the official um, definition of diagnosis is um, there's a, something called a diagnostic confidence level of DCL, where a clinician um, evaluates an individual's motor impairments, and they rate those impairments on a score from one to four. Um, four means that the clinician is at least 99% confident that the motor impairments are nothing else but Huntington disease. So the first time an individual gets a DCL score of four, that's when the, they are officially diagnosed. Now, the whole can of worms, the controversy is that, well, that's super subjective. What do you mean not at least 99% confident? That has, that's a debate that's been going on in the field for at least a decade, at least as long as I've been in this field. Um, but some papers have, that have been published on that show that even though there is that controversy and other definitions are now being considered, um, the clinicians are well trained in that, that there is um, consistency or uniformity in terms of determining that diagnosis. Yes. Right, so, so somebody who you've tested with this gene, so you're 100% sure that they have the potential for it. Yes. But if they're showing even by, by, by their own lifestyle or, or, or quality of life, some impairment, if it doesn't reach that level for 99%, they would not be yes. diagnosed as having the disease, even though you know that. Yes, yes, exactly. So they're going to get the disease eventually if they don't. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we have more questions from online, the virtual. Yes, we do, <laughs> uh, and and uh, I'll, we'll defer to Dr. Gonzalez. But this may be our uh, close to our last question. A, uh, a quote unquote simple clinical question. Uh, mm -hmm. If they aren't diagnosed, how do you know they will be diagnosed? Aren't they by definition diagnosed since they are in the study? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's similar to the question that the gentleman asked in the room. So you can be, um, there's a difference between genetically diagnosed. So they have this gene mutation. If they have that gene mutation, then they will eventually develop this disease. But the clinical diagnosis is based on, um, like I said, evaluating the individual's motor impairments and finding out the first time um, that a clinician believes with at least 99% confidence that those motor impairments are nothing else but Huntington disease. So that's a different, so you, you're born with this gene mutation. That doesn't mean that the disease starts at birth. It starts, the, diagno the official di clinical diagnosis starts much later. Well, um, I think that might conclude. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but uh, before we we adjourn and conclude, we we do uh, have a nice plaque uh, for Dr. Uh, Tanya Garcia for the, her uh, in recognition of her significant contributions in statistics, mentoring, and uh, leadership. Thank you.
Right. Um, so just a, a so that concludes um, the uh, uh, lecture portion uh, for folks who are in the room. Uh, we do have a uh, reception uh, outside. A couple of uh, uh, last minute housekeeping uh, reminders, um, encouragements. Uh, the WSS Washington Statistical Society is always looking for events uh, and volunteers. Uh, we are trying to encourage more in person events, getting people uh, together to network, to you know, talk to uh, colleagues in the field. I want to put a plug in uh, for uh, June 25th, uh, the president's invited talk, uh, which will be hosted at uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It also will coincide with our awards ceremony and annual awards reception. Um, and so with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and joining us today, uh, both in person and, and online. Oh, my God.